kind of a competitive fair thing. So I haven't done much research into those rules, but yeah, okay. usually so they make it so. Let me catch so you up to speed. 462nd best male swimmer, best female swimmer, NCAA champion. Do you see a problem with that? Are, are you suggesting that she, that she transitioned to a woman to get better at swimming? Of course. And, and we shouldn't allow why that to you, happen. Why because would you transition yourself just to become better at a sport? Who because does that? you're a narcissist. That's why. <laughs> What's up, YouTube? Hope you guys are feeling good. Today, guys, we're back here on a new video. Today, we're going to check it out. Charlie Cook debates college students at UC Border. Okay? There's a full video. And I'm going to Charlie kick because of kicking us. This is going to be amazing. Let's get right to today's video. I just kind of wanted to come here to gain some perspective, but I am a disagreeer. Um, so, seeing that we. Uh, talked about the housing market and we talked about, um, you know, the price of college, right, going skyrocket in America. If we look to our European neighbors, we're seeing them do a lot better in this sector, and that's because of centralized policies that America hasn't even started on yet, and yet you want, like, a free market kind of, like, solution. So how are, how are we failing, and how is Europe succeeding? Well, yeah, I don't accept the premise, but I appreciate Same the that you're succeeding. But um, let me ask you, I ask you a question. Do you think that there's too many people going to college in America? Uh, I do not. Okay. So what's the national college graduation rate? Ballpark. What do you um, think it is? How, what, what, people going in to how many people graduate? Get a diploma. Again, I'm, I'm not too familiar with yeah. the amount that's okay. That's, that's fine. Out. 59%. So 41% of people that go to college don't graduate. By a show of hands, how many know people that dropped out of college? Raise your hand. Every single hand goes up. Right. So we have way too many people going to college in America. So my first thing, my first belief, is that we have to decline college enrollment dramatically in this country. I'd say, well, Charlie, what are you going to do? Well, I will agree with you on one thing. It's where the Germans get right. It's that we need more welders and plumbers, electricians, police officers, entrepreneurs, and people that work with their hands. And a lot less people that are kind of in the cloud studying postmodernism, right? So I think college is a racket, largely. I think it's a scam. I think that young people are told to take classes that have no relevancy to their own degree. So let me ask you, have you taken classes that just you think are kind of a waste of time, or do you think it's all just been phenomenally meaningful? I feel like it's a step in, like, a, the right career, right? You get the right amount of, like, technical skills and also the right amount of soft skills necessary for the, you know, career that you're going into. And I feel like saying that people shouldn't be enrolling in college is actively saying that some people just don't deserve to go to college. And no, I don't feel like saying that's the that case. at all. I mean, I think college makes you poorer, makes you less happy, and less likely to flourish. So let me ask a question. Show of hands in the room. We'll use the democracy thing, right? How many of you have felt that you took a class that was a total waste of time, waste of money, and all that? Okay. I mean, so this is a scam, man. Like, if, if, I, was a, if I was a financial regulator, I would, uh, it's just like Bernie Madoff stuff, man. It's like every question I ask, yep, I know people that dropped out. Yep, I took classes that don't have any relevance to your degree. And so the question is, what is the purpose of college, right? So if every college is like Hillsdale College, I'd probably agree with you. If you guys were studying Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, getting deep into the classics, rejecting postmodernism, understanding the beauty of the American founding, then so be it. But like if we have to have these like extended discussions of like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault and black only dormitories and what is critical theory, you guys are getting ripped off. And it, it, I believe firmly that, so what is the market response first and foremost? Get a mass, and this might be wishful thinking, get a massive portion of the population not to go to college, go into technical schools, learn to work with their hands, and value muscular labor again in our country, which muscular labor is insulted, talked down to, and I could prove it to you. Um, go to a suburban family, anyone, maybe in Cherry Creek or in Centennial or whatever. If you go to a regular suburban family, if you get a mom in private, she'll say, I just don't want my kid to work construction. Every suburban mom will say that. No matter what, I don't want my kid to sweat for a living. And okay, that has created a hyper-educated, very unwise generation that's super in debt and has pieces of paper and they mean absolutely nothing. Right? So it's sure. a generation that has borrowed money they don't have to study things that don't matter, to find jobs that don't exist. So to answer your question, the whole thing's a racket from how we get young people from high school to try to go to college and all this. We need to disrupt it completely, end federal subsidies, end state subsidies, make college support themselves on, the own, on their own, make, make, colleges, so make colleges go raise their own donor money. For, the, like, for example, if like feminist queer theory is super important to you, fine. Go raise the money, 
and support it on your own, right? Don't ask the taxpayer to underwrite that. And by the way, you look at Europe, just to finish the point, they're, they're getting away from woke universities. France has actually decreed, Emmanuel Macron ran on this, he said that we need to try to reject American woke ideology that is seeping into French institutions. So to kind of use your own example, Europe's rejecting the very same thing that I believe has infected American higher education. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thoughtful question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I got a bit of stage fright. Uh, first of all, I'd like to preface my question with two accents, or two things. Uh, firstly, huge fan. Secondly, I am a biologist, in case anyone uh, would like to refute me afterwards. What is a woman? That's, <laughs> that's what I'm graduating in this, in this, this spring. But, um, so I would like to um, ask you regarding a logical fallacy sure. um, that I've, sorry. Um, the idea of the slippery slope yes. has largely been um, invalidated in um, conversations, especially today. But I think uh, one axiom that I've seen propagated throughout multiple multiple mediums is that of uh, went from let us get married to now we want to teach yep. sexuality to your elementary schoolers. And don't get me wrong, I don't care what you do with your life as long as it doesn't impact my life and those around me. I like to consider myself an open-minded individual, but once you impede on my stuff, that's when I start to get a little don't tread on me. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very curious as to your, um, your perception with regards to yeah, I, I, the, I, I, the idea of the fallacy sure. and if someone were to use that is a logical fallacy against you, how would you refute that? Yeah, I, I get that all the time. So people uh, will say that, look, it's not a logical fallacy that things go on a slippery – it is a logical fallacy because it's a slippery slope. I reject the premise. I think slippery slopes are true. Um, you look at any sort of course of history, you do see incremental erosion of freedoms and liberties. You do see small things become big things. Um, I'm not to say, now, the reason it's a logical fallacy, just so you understand, is it's not applicable to all things. That's not to say, though, that slippery slopes don't happen. Those are two different things, right? So if you want to just like take a logic class 101, go through Aristotelian logic, you're right. It cannot be applied to an argument every time because it's not, it's not scientific, right? There are examples. I could give you one. Like seatbelt laws, it stopped and it got kind of annoying, but it, was kind of, it just kind of slowed down, right? That doesn't, that's not the same thing as saying, though, that slippery slopes have not happened and they will continue to happen. Right? For example, uh, in New York, they started with like, oh, we want abortions to be safe, legal, and rare. And then it's like, oh, we want late-term abortions. And now it's like we're entertaining post-birth abortions, which is what they're entertaining in California, where you can have abortion up to uh, 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 post-birth in Colorado. Okay. So that's a slippery slope, isn't it? So I, I hope that helps a little bit, where technically it is a logical fallacy because it's not applicable to every issue. However, you should isolate and say, how many slippery slopes have we lived through? Because it's still a real thing, right? Where, where the erosion of liberty can start at one thing or the erosion of decency or virtue or goodness, right? So a great example is, okay, we start with you know, same-sex marriage. Okay, that was lost. And then we went to, you're going to force a baker to make a cake. Okay, that was lost. And now it goes to, we want to teach five-year-olds about very graphic sex education. It's like, wow, we went a long way from just wanting people to have equal rights with marriage to now going to five-year-olds. Now, the reason why they'll call it a logical fallacy is because you could not scientifically apply it that way or mathematically because it wasn't assuredly going to be a, a, a slippery slope. But there still exists. Yeah. So I, I would encourage you to kind of push back on it, add some nuance to that, right? And if, if, if it's, it's one of the most insane things. Like study the history of the Soviet Union and tell me slippery slopes don't exist, mm. right? Study Cambodia. Study Maoist China, right? Look what's happening, you know, in Colorado with what you just said, the pro-life bill and some of these other things. So I hope that's somewhat helpful um, to push back on that a little bit. And it's a very thoughtful question. So thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, Charlie. Um, I was told to keep it short, so I will. Okay. Um, so you touched on LGBTQ rights a lot. You've talked about, you know, trans bathrooms, you getting banned from Twitter, very, you know, awful. Um, but I'm wondering if I can get a straight answer, yes or no, do you think the acceptance of queer people in society is a good thing? Well, define acceptance and define queer, because when I grew up, that was like a slander. So I don't know, that's like a thing now. Uh, queer being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, 
And um, what was the other word you What do you mean find? acceptance? What, what do you mean? Acceptance being that, you know, society, you know, you know, accepts that, doesn't try to change that, doesn't try to um, say that it's not a social, like, it's not a good thing for you to be gay, it's not a good thing for you to be trans, and, um, and you know, in our institutions also, just get, offering them resources to, um, you know, just come to terms with their sexuality, not feel bad about it, basically. By acceptance, I generally mean society shouldn't make people feel bad about who they are. So, do you agree with that? No, no. I mean, we should feel bad about all sorts of things. So, I mean, yeah, happy to get the mic back up. But I mean, I'll just ask you a very simple question, and this will tell: What is a woman? A woman is someone who identifies as a woman. Got it. So, um, so can so do you think a definition of someone be able to become pregnant would be a woman? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? So, if someone can become pregnant, would that person be defined as a woman? Depends on if they identify as a woman. Right. So, okay. We're now getting to the root of the issue. So, do you believe that truth is objective or subjective? Do you believe in absolute truth? Sure. Okay. So, if you believe in absolute truth, shouldn't we have absolute terms of what a infant-bearing or infant-birthing person is, otherwise known as a woman? No. Okay. So, let me ask you, let me ask you this a different way, I suppose. So, if anyone can identify at anything at any time, correct? Anyone can identify as, as a woman or a man. You can just choose at any time, right? Gender? Well, sure. gender identity isn't switching genders all the time. It just depends. Like, but that's your position, right? That's fair to say that you could change your gender. My position is that you should accept people's gender identity, and you shouldn't right. okay, try to shame them out. So of it. let me ask you: should we, <laughs> should we accept people that think they're younger than they actually are? Okay, that's a tricky one. Because that—that is—that's—that's that's a mental condition where people say, I identify as an eight-year-old, but they're really 50. Should we accept someone be able to say they're younger? No, but I think that's a very false equivalence. Why is it a false equivalence? Because there's scientific research supporting that gender identity is something that is, you know, like, um, there's scientific research that supports people and says that if you identify as a certain gender, then that is, like, your gender, there's this paper on Scientific American that I found very interesting that said, like, you know, it has to do with, um, like, your brain formation in the womb where gender identity forms, but it's different from sex. That's very different from a, in a disorder where you say, I'm not actually on my age because... Well, hold on. You just, you just agreed with me. You said it's a brain formation issue. It's a brain formation... I didn't say it was a disorder. Well, so you don't think transgenderism is a disorder? No. What is gender dysphoria? Gender dysphoria is when you're very uncomfortable with your, um, with your own body, and that usually relates to gender, and that can usually be treated if you choose a transition to... Right, so it's a mental condition, right? That's, well, gender dysphoria is, but transgenderism okay. is not. What's the difference? <sighs> the difference between gender dysphoria and, tran and transgenderism? Yes. Trans being transgender means that you don't identify with the gender you're born with. Gender dysphoria means you're uncomfortable with your body. So there are two different things. No, there is, so you cannot be, quote, unquote, transgender without suffering from gender dysphoria. So let me ask you one more question. So you believe that we can dictate pronouns. Can I choose my adjectives? Can I decide to be, like, super rich? Or, like, can someone, like, can I decide to be small? Like, is there anything objective that we have to actually admit? Or can you just change anything at any time? I think people should have the right to determine their pronouns. And I don't think... No, how about adjectives? <laughs> I don't think people actually do that, so I don't know why that's no, something. Okay. Well, of course, like if someone says, I declare I'm rich, it's no longer than saying, I'm declare I'm a man. Your chromosomes aren't that way. You don't get to choose what your reality is, do you? You, gender identity is reality. Gen okay, so anyone could be anything. Let me ask, how about species reality? Can I change my species? No. Why? Not. There's people that identify as cats and dogs all the time. It's a serious mental condition. It is. It's treated all the time. True. Tens of thousands of cases every True. single year. So, so basically, if you believe in absolute truth, which you say you do, why wouldn't you believe in absolute truth when it comes to chromosomal structure? Because gender and chromosomal sex are two different things. That's right, according to your opinion. Got it. Okay, so, but I now, that, that's now you want actually. to impose that opinion on the rest of society, right? You can have whatever opinion you want. Here's our position. That opinion should now not apply to all of a sudden saying that men and women's sports should be conflated. Final question. Did you find a moral problem with the University of Pennsylvania swimmer changing from a man to a woman and winning the NCAA championship, defeating other women? Well, I'm not familiar, but I'm pretty sure that the NCAA has some rules that makes it so people who transition have, like, you know, 
kind of a competitive fair thing. So I haven't done much research into those rules, but yeah, okay. usually so they make it so. Let me catch so you up to speed. 462nd best male swimmer, best female swimmer, NCAA champion. Do you see a problem with that? Are, are you suggesting that she, that she transitioned to a woman to get better at swimming? Yes. Of course. And, and we shouldn't allow why that to you, happen. Why because would you transition yourself just to become better at a sport? Who because does that? you're a narcissist. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> that's true. Because you're a tr it's, like, it's like saying, why would anyone steal anything? Why would anyone cut in line? People do bad things. It's not up to us as society to accommodate the rules for your impulses to go do bad things. Last question. Do you think there's differences between men and women? Was this the actual last question? Yeah, last, last. I'm, just, I'm curious. No, I'm curious because I, I can't believe you're paying for this. It's like so interesting. Well, there are actual differences between men and women, yes, in terms of, you know, chromosomes, as you mentioned. So, yeah, sure. Okay, so therefore we agree that men and women have differences. We should define society around those differences. And one of those differences is that women are, they have lower testosterone levels, and they could be easily exploited by men, which is what happens far too often, and it's incumbent on men who have higher testosterone levels, who are physically stronger per to protect women against the exploitation of men who think they are women. That's a moral question and a moral claim. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Hello, Charlie. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so I definitely would say I agree with you on a lot of things, um, but I guess just to kind of make it Fun. something. Uh, well, not necessarily. Well, so, uh, you know, I'm a guy. I'm a plumber. I work the trade. I'm an anarchist. We oh, definitely okay. agree. <laughs> we agree on a lot of stuff, but there's, there's a couple things that, uh, we might disagree we'll on, like disagree secession on and, and various things like that. Um, but really coming here, I wanted to, I guess, ask you, um, a guy like me, young guy, what, and I think there's a lot of people in the room that probably ask this exact same question, um, who are more reading, uh, leaning on the right. What can we do to help push the um, country in the direction that we want to see it? Because I don't feel like voting is doing it for us. That's yeah. what led me the okay, direction that I'm in. Voting's important, but what can you do? We've got to have bigger families. We've got to support our churches and support our pastors that are proclaiming truth. See one in the back, Fervent Church. Is that right? Do I see? That's amazing. Great church in Colorado Springs. They do such a great job. Um, then we've got to get to work. We've got to build things that last and matter. So one of the things is we've got to have more conservative business that businesses that are owned by us that share our values so that we're cancel-proof. That's a real thing, regardless of what you think the future of the country looks like. It's, we we got to start our own businesses. Now, that doesn't excuse us from what I believe holding these current businesses accountable, like Disney, which has become a child predator operation, right? True. And so it's inexcusable what Disney has become. It's unbelievable. And what really frustrates me about Disney, just as a side de small detour, is that they made billions being the safe haven for families for years, and then they turn around and they use that against. It's just so sick and so wrong. But we got to build stuff. We have to be positive and forward thinking. And I have to say, in my kind of mixed bag of analysis, this is one thing I really appreciate about Elon Musk, is he's a builder. And I love builders. There's complainers and there's doers. And i got to say, I just stand in awe. I'm like, this guy has how many companies? He's trying to go to what planet? It's remarkable. And, I, and, I, 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 and again, I'm against some the moral and philosophical claims of what he does. He does way too much business with China, all that stuff. But I think that we as a movement would be better suited. Like, what are we going to build that's ambitious and beautiful? Are we going to build the next Disney? I guarantee you someone in this room right now has the potential to build a multi-billion dollar company. That's a real thing, right? Like, regardless, you might you, know, you believe in no government, all that stuff, whatever, fine. We can go through, over that. Probably never. But um, <laughs> the, the point is that's a real thing. So build things that last. Mm. Build things that are beautiful. Beautiful families, beautiful communities, beautiful churches. Support good businesses. Take risks. Be an entrepreneur. That's, that's more important than voting. So I want you to imagine if someone hears what I just said, they're like, I'm going to start the next Disney, and they do it. Imagine the cultural impact of that, right? And you might say, oh, Charlie, that will never happen. I disagree. I think the spirit of the American entrepreneur hasn't even started taking risks, especially on the center right. It's like, no, I'm going to go start something big, bold, ambitious, and beautiful. And we're starting to see more and more people start to do that. Like, we're going to start our own Starbucks. I see some people pointing themselves. Good. I believe in you. You can do it. Totally. Like, only in America 
can you do really gritty, awesome things? Like, and I'm living proof of this, right? I started Turning Point USA 10 years ago when I was 18 years old in the suburbs of Chicago, no money, no connections, no idea what I was doing. We're now on thousands of high school and college campuses across the country, over 250 people on staff. I now have a podcast, a radio show, all this. And I look around, I'm like, only in America could a kid who didn't go to college, who no one believed in, and then people started to, and amazing generosity followed. Is that possible, right? And so, so for you, it's like, you're a plumber, right? Then go start an incredible, like, go start the next task rabbit. I'm not kidding. Like, go start a conservative tax rabbit. Great, amazing idea for a company, by the way. Whoever came up with tax rabbit, I want to meet them. It's a phenomenal, you, don't, you know what that is? It's, it's, you could hire somebody for a couple hours to go do, like, putting together a bed frame or, like, fixing a dishwasher. It's a phenomenal idea. Like, you could do that. And that's what we need to start thinking of, right? The positive, forward thinking. Because here's the thing. We're dealing with an incredibly suppressive and negative force over our country right now, right? They want you to think that our country is going to fall apart. And like, I just went through all the things wrong, okay? But what are the risks we're going to take to make the country better? And one of those are building better families, b building bigger b businesses, you know, better businesses, leaning into our local community, helping our local church. Those are things that last regardless of the criminality of our political class, which I think you and I could have a lot of fun talking about. So True. thanks for being here tonight. True. Appreciate it. First. Oh. Hi, Charlie. Uh, it's so cool to see you. I remember watching you like 2016 on like Dave Rubin. It's pretty, pretty dope. You're a killer. Thank you. Um, so in the beginning of your speech, you spoke on the conservatizing moments yes. that happened to a person. It's amazing. I love that. Marriage, kids, owning property. The problem I see is the left has the progressivizing narratives of culture. They have the climate change catastrophe. They have uh, the party switch where supposedly the Republicans are the ones responsible for slavery. And go on and on. I'm sure you more than I do. How do conservative commentators and the conservative moment, or movement fight these, these, this mythological warfare they wage when us as conservatives can't even agree on whether we believe in anthropogenic or nuclear is the, out, the answer or carbon capture or maybe we were the racists but now we're not. But, so how do we do? Because we, we uh, conservatives are much more atomized. So, how does, so my question is, is that how does conservative media – uh, creative, like a, a media bastion to yeah. actually fight this? That's a, that's a really good question. So you're asking how do we win? That's the, basically the essence well, of your question. We, how, right? do we, like, how do we create counter-narratives that yeah, we all agree so, on? We so, don't have a party line. So yeah, so the first thing is, it, is the, the easiest way to create a counter-narrative is thankfully the insanity of the other side. So they're doing a lot of it for us. And I'll explain what I mean. But the second part is I completely agree and I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on the struggle. The first thing is I believe this woke stuff is so unbelievably stupid. It's unpopular. It doesn't work. It just like doesn't make sense to normal people that they're going to be in for such a reckoning they're not even going to know what hit them. I believe it will be an extinction event politically for anyone that associates with woke policies. Defund the police. Get rid of the prisons. You know, this we just went into the whole thing. Can men become pregnant? All this garbage, right? Like, that's the stuff where normal, everyday people, especially Hispanic voters, by the way, um, which you're seeing the biggest shift in, re they're like, this doesn't make any sense, I want out of it, totally. So that's actually been keeping some of the conservative messaging unified, which is anti. Now, there's a lesson in this. In the 1980s, conservatives were unified in messaging because we all hated the Soviet Union. That's all we talked about, right? Hate communism, hate the Soviet Union. Libertarians got along with conservatives. Anarchists got along with whatever. Everyone got along because we hate the Soviet Union. You're starting to see a little bit of that spirit renewed right mm -hmm. now. If you kind of see, like, we, like tr even the people that are like, Charlie might disagree with you on, like, I'm a libertarian, but I hate the woke left. Let's fight them. That's good. The second part is, like, we have to do some soul searching of what does it mean to actually be a conservative. And that's the second part, True. right? It's like what happens when you win, what happens when you govern. So here's my, here's my standard opinion. Without t getting abstract in the theory, I have a test case now, a three-and-a-half-year test case of what I believe a conservative looks like, Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is what a conservative looks like. And so we don't have to overthink it. I think that's a unifying thing, right? So we can go through it. Like why? Banning critical race theory, not allowing kids to be taught this garbage in schools, right? Not allowing, you know, no, no bail, funding the police, funding fatherhood initiatives, right? Anti-lockdowns, no vaccine mandates, right? Pushing back against these ridiculous congressional maps. Like, whoa, like that's, that's a way forward. So the question is, how do we do it? I think we have to elevate and reward the people that do it in tough places and do it with articulation and charisma. So earlier in your speech, you said that one in five Americans, no, one in five people in this country will be illegal. Yes, um, in, three you years, three years. In, in three years. In three years. 
Um, you proposed that securing our borders will help this situation, but I also think that our green card slash citizenship problem uh, process is a problem. So how do you suggest that we make it easier for people who want to get in this country legally to do that? Yeah, well, first of all, um, thank you. I, I agree with part of that. I don't think – so there's this idea that we have to make it easier to get into the country. I probably agree with that. So I think that we should have a moratorium on immigration right now. I think we've got to slow down. We have way too many people coming into America. We've got to throttle back and digest the mm. meal. We've got to allow assimilation to happen. Sure. We, gotta allow, we have way too many people coming into America. Now, Tens that's not saying thousands. legal immigration shouldn't go up again. I think it could be a phenomenal asset to America, and it has been a phenomenal asset. But many times in American history, specifically the 1950s and early 1960s, we ratcheted back to almost zero immigration into America. The reason is post-World War II. Of course, you know, there was a lot of damage in other places, but the, there was plenty of people that wanted to come to America in the 1950s, a ton. Think about it. Europe is destroyed. But they said, we have a moral obligation to World War II veterans to make sure they have good wages, good jobs, and we're going to deliver for them. That was a moral argument. Right? And so legal immigration should always be viewed through the prism. Does it benefit the country and the citizens that are already here? Currently, our legal immigration system is so messed up that we prioritize the people that don't share Western values, and we don't bring the people that could potentially share Western values. I'll give you an example. The best example of how our legal immigration system is messed up is Minneapolis. Hmm. Have you been to Minneapolis in the last five years? It is unrecognizable. Now, people call me a racist for saying this. I'm not. I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. When you have a call to prayer approved by a Minneapolis city council, I'm going to tell you that does not mesh with American values. I'm sorry. It doesn't. And when you come into this country and you have someone like Elon Omar that talks endlessly about how awful America is, despite being a beneficiary mm. of the generosity and benevolence of America, I say there's something fundamentally wrong with you. Right? Now, I contrast that with some amazing immigrants that come here legally that learn the pledge and they, they, they mesh beautifully into American society. So where's the balance? Right now, we have to slow down, throttle it back. We're doing things way too quickly. Our green card system has a million people coming in every single year. So I think that we need to have an English test to come into America. I think that there should be – that certain countries should be prioritized other, over other countries. I think certain countries share Western values, um, and we should be unafraid to say that. It's a thought crime. I don't care. All people are created equal. All cultures are not created equal. They're not. I'm sorry. The Chinese Communist Party is not an equal culture to America. I think there should be a moratorium of Chinese Communist Party people coming into America. Chinese Communist Party values are not synonymous with Western values. They're not. Instead, I want people that fit into the American experiment, fit into the story. And that's not a racial thing, by the way, at all, whatsoever. I believe that Cubans can make some of the, have and will make and do make the greatest Americans in America. It's not a racial thing. Instead, so you look at it and say, wow. Is this actually making America more free and fulfilling our obligation to our fellow countrymen? What I just said, I get attacked wildly for. I don't care. It's true, and someone needs to say it. And opening your borders, say anyone can come for any reason whatsoever, regardless if they speak the language, regardless if they agree with Western values, regardless of their belief in the Constitution, is wrong. And it's, it's destroying the hmm. country from within. It is. And true. you see it in Minneapolis. You have Elon Omar elected to public office. She is the mascot for an immigration moratorium. You see her, you're like, there's something wrong with that. She has nothing but negative, vile, mean things to say about America when she was rescued in a Kenyan refugee camp and brought in by our own benevolence. Guess what? Our generosity has been taken advantage over the last 20 years. It's time we put our citizens first. Thank you. Um, over the last two years during COVID, I've gotten more into politics and just realizing how important that is in my life. Um, as a Christian, I have friends that don't quite understand the gender ideology debate yep. and how to interact with people of that community um, while, be, while being loving, but also being a fan of absolute truth. Um, how do you go about that? Yeah, look, um, just don't lie, right? We should want the best for all people. Um, I do not believe transitioning your gender is the right thing for people. I don't. I think it's a lie, and I think that we should tell people that suicide rates True. are extremely high for people that transition. There's 30,000 plus people in an open Facebook book uh, group, uh, open Facebook group, I should say, that are regretting their transition and wish they could reverse it. Uh, transitional regret, regret is a huge thing, um, and I just think we have to stay very close to biological reality. And this is one of the main reasons why we, in the English lexicon in the Western world, have messed up what love is. Uh, love is not giving people what they want. It isn't. Love is, get, is, is helping people get towards things that are true, good, and beautiful. And I do not believe assisting or subsidizing someone to chemically castrate themselves is the right thing in any way, shape, or form. Now, if you want to do that and you're like super like into that, 
I guess there is a pocket to do that. But especially when you look at children and then children without parental consent and then children without parental consent funded by the government. Like, what are we doing here? So how do we talk about this as Christians? We should want the best for everybody. I pray that someone who's struggling with gender dysphoria can have a collision course with Jesus Christ and give their life to the Lord and realize that they have been living a lie. I, I want that for them. I do. I don't wish harm upon them, but I'm also not going to lie. Like, I'm not going to do this weird thing that people do. It's like, well, it's your truth. It's actually not. Like, God made you a certain way. He made you a certain chromosomes. You might think you're something, right? And so here's the other thing, which is that people say, well, it's what they want. Look, we have societal boundaries against what people want all the time, right? The law is the wise restraint that keeps you free. Um, now, I'm not equating this morally, because I don't think they're exactly – you know, similar. But if we allow people to do what mm. they want, we wouldn't have pedophilia laws. We wouldn't. Okay, so we draw a line there. All right. If we allow people to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it, then we wouldn't have public decency laws. But they're getting rid of those too, by the way. Like, you know, public nudity is allowed in San Francisco, which is like, of course, like the biggest problem I guess they're facing. I don't know. Uh, to allow people to walk around that way. So look, it all comes down to the question of what is love, right? So we as, we as Christians understand there's four different types of love in the Greek, right? Eros, agape, storge, and phileo, a brotherly love, a, a father and son love, or a mother and son love, or a fatherly, a um, kind of parental love, right? A romantic love, or a sacrificial love, right? And we conflate all of those in the Western world all the time. Um, I believe firmly, and you look at the transition regret, um, and it, it's, it's, it will take your breath away at how many people um, wish they did not transition. So what happens is they get a transition, and they're happy for like five years, and it goes off a cliff completely. All the psychological data shows that. So the question really is, you know, Charlie, what do you think our role is this? Look, I, I said it earlier. You want to do whatever you want to do? Like, you want to be a vegan? You want, like, I, that's not my business, right? However, don't ask me to now reconfigure society that's worked pretty brilliantly for the last 2,000 years mm. because of your own personal opinion. That is pandering to a hyper-vocal minority that will mm. never be appeased. Two separate issues, right? So I could go back and forth like what is good. You saw that earlier. But the separate issue that shouldn't be a question is what we actually do with society, okay? Then from a Christian perspective, all things with grace and all things with truth. 100% grace. We want people to be born new, but do not lie. Do not lie. And that includes calling somebody something that they aren't. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thoughts? Earlier, you mentioned the U.S. turning into uh, the Soviet Union. Yeah. Given the meteoric rise of anti-white and anti-American rhetoric in left-wing circles, do you believe this language is being used with the intent to turn everyday Americans into kulaks? <laughs> kulaks! Yeah, that's it. Let me tell people what a kulak is. So a kulak was a um, farmer in the 1930s that owned like an acre of land in the Soviet Union. And they were once friends of the regime, of the Stalin regime, and immediately they became enemies. Where anyone that owned land immediately brought, got thrown to gulags and thrown to all sorts of different types of areas. Um, yeah, look, so I'll say this. Um, I, I oppose bigotry in every single form, and I also oppose bigotry against white people. And it really bothers me how people are allowed to say that, like openly, like the bigotry against white people. Like, oh, yeah, stop acting so white, or I don't like white people. Like, I think that's wrong. Like, we should, it's wrong against no matter what skin color you say with that. So I just wanted to introduce with that. Do I think it's a strategy to turn people into kulaks? I don't know. That might be a step too far. It could be. Um, but do I think that there's a deliberate campaign to try to create an enemy? Yeah, absolutely. Every Soviet, every Soviet or totalitarian or tyrannical movement needs an other, right? It needs a movement where they can try and say they're the problem and we need to demonize them. I believe it's less racial at times and it's more value-based and it's definitely Judeo-Christian. They want anything that is rooted in Judeo-Christianity to be the enemy and to try to wipe it out altogether. So kulaks are one of the worst, uh, was one of the worst chapters in Soviet history. So, um, so people could learn a lot from it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. We'll do three more. Charlie, uh, you spoke about immigration, about 20% of our, our population being illegal immigrants. I traveled to Sweden four times. Yep. And in 1970s, they had a socialist prime minister by the name of Olaf Palm, who led a million immigrant immigrants from, the, from, from Somalia, from yep. uh, Iraq. And it, the Somalis could not be assimilated into Swedish society. Yes. They, they, they formed ghettos, and it backfired on Olaf Palm. He was assassinated by a Somali immigrant. So what's the question? Don't you think that we need more immigration? You know, do you think we need to uh, 
you know, to board, find more border patrols, free, uh, yeah. have our uh, right of work. And yeah, uh, uh, that's been my whole uh, deal. Yeah, look, I think we need restricted immigration. I said that earlier. Um, and I think we need to take a pause to allow this mass influx of people into America an opportunity to assimilate and to see whether or not this is actually benefiting the American citizen, the American worker. What you talk about in Sweden is absolutely true. The Swedish Democrats, which is the conservative party in Sweden, is they're, they're set for a huge electoral landslide because of mass immigration. Thank you for your question. I'm sorry, we've we, we got to get to the next one. Thank you, Charlie, for coming. Um, I have edited this question down, and I'll try to get to the point. Limit, man. Um, what do you think is, what is your opinion about the use of psychedelic drugs <laughs> in relative terms to therapy? I know it's a controversial topic. I, I don't know enough about it. Okay. Uh, let, let me be That's very fine. clear. Um, I'm not in favor of the legalization of weed. I was against it when it happened. I'm against it now. I think that weed does not improve the human condition. I think it makes you less free, not more free. Not a popular opinion to say here in Colorado. Uh, I don't care. Uh, I'm going to say things that are true. Um, I, I personally, visiting Colorado my whole life, the moment you legalize weed, this place become messier, dirtier, less enjoyable the minute that you guys legalize weed. However, that's not the question, right? I don't know enough about psychedelic drugs or their potential therapeutic um, uh, sort of uh, benefits. I will say ketamine therapy, which is intravenously administered, is a type of psychedelic. It is a mushroom. And there's some phenomenal data to show that ketamine therapy given intravenously can help people with alcohol addiction, depression, anxiety. So in a controlled medical environment, I actually support the introduction of some of these. But that's, that's not like some people will say like LSD. I, I think that's all a bunch of garbage. But ketamine in particular is technically a psychedelic which is a very, very promising new kind of thing on the block, if you will, that's helping people break through depression, anxiety, and all of that. But I think we've got to be really careful going too far east, if you will, into some of this yeah, stuff. I, I know people's lives that have been so damaged by ayahuasca. It's not a joke, everybody. Do not do it. Uh, ayahuasca is a psychedelic. It's done in Central and South America. People are opening up. If you don't know what ayahuasca is, watch the Vice documentary. I bet a lot of the kids know who ayahuasca is. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but um, it's, that's a psychedelic. And they say it's for medical purposes, and I'd seen it destroy people's lives. I didn't anticipate talking about psychedelics tonight, but thank, thank you, you for I, the question. I, I, I... Okay, this was amazing to watch. I love the entire question. I love how Charlie handled every single one of them. It's, it's beautiful. It's pretty long. Uh, but it's really important to watch the entire clip because these are thoughtful questions, number one, and they are really important in the society we live in today. So, guys, concerning the first guy who talked about college, it's very, very important because I know a lot of people who has dropped out from college. Like a lot of people who have dropped out. Number one reason is because they lack interest. Number two is because they don't have financial capacity to, to finish the college. So it's very, very important for us not to base the entire life about college because a lot of things that teachers in college, we, we actually don't use them. But that does not mean they are not necessary or they are not useful in some way. It's just that it does not relate to the course we are offering. That is the um, the aspect right there. College is, is very important. It's very, very important, should be told. But the way the society has framed it to be that without college, you are not in this in the, in the entire world. We are not in life. It's, it's terrible. It's a bad statement. It's a bad narrative. And it, sh it should be changed. With or without college, you can be something and someone great in life and very, very important in society. That is number one factor I want to put straight. Number two is about the guy who talked about transgenderism. The transgenderism aspect of it is that I don't believe in transgender. I don't believe in... Um, I, I can't hide that. According to what Charlie said, the truth is bitter sometimes, but we have to spill it out. It's very important that we tell them the truth, even if it's to hurt their feelings or not. We are not here to pamper that ego or pamper that feelings. No, we had to tell them the truth, whether it hurts them or not. Transgenderism as a whole, a lot of people have regretted that, that surgery. Pardon me. A lot of people have regretted that surgery, doing the surgery. After five years, they, they regret it. During the time they transition, uh, they, they're happy within first two, three, four years. But once they get to five, six, they're regretting the actions. There are a lot of people who I have seen, I have watched clips of people who regretted their surgeries and it was it's a life altering decision that it's it alters your full life, your full existence. Like some girls I saw who 
um, Judah Peterson interview, a lady, she cut off her breast, and right now she can't grow it back. You understand? So it's a life altering decision that people regret later on because you put off your, put on the makeup and you go to the women's restroom. That does not make you a woman. Some a lot of them have the genitals in, in tats, the male genitals. And a lot of women have reported assault, rape, harassment through because of people who feel like they identify as a woman and they're going to the women's restroom. I will be scared if I'm a father and my daughter is going to the restroom and I see a full-grown man dressed as a woman and with makeup, with a handbag, say he identifies as a woman and going to the same restroom with my daughter. I'll be terrified myself. Because this is very, very alarming and something we are sweeping under the carpet and something we are keeping quiet about. It is very dangerous. And if we keep our mouth silent and not speak out the truth, it will lead to a more chaotic society, more than what we are seeing right now. We can't accept it. According to that, that second guy who came there and said they should accept them for who they are, we can't accept such narrative. We can't accept such people in society. It, it's really alarming. It is very, very serious. And the more we keep quiet, the more the community of transgenderism, LGBTQ+, the, the letter is very long, continue growing. And the more it's growing, the more it's affecting the upcoming generations. It is very, very serious. These are uh, chaotic things that are, that are affecting society right now. And it can affect society later on in the future. The entire video was amazing. I love about the um, border control. America have to, we have to be more, more, careful about our border who are lying to the America. Tens of thousands, like according to statistics, 10,000 people come into America every single day. It is really, really serious. It is very, very serious because we have to control the regulation. We have to regulate it that this is a certain number of people with the with the papers complete and everything intact. So to for us to reduce the illegal immigration, illegal people who are coming to America, it's it's very, very alarming. And if we do not control it now, it will get worse later on again in the future. And right now we are getting to um right now we are getting to um election era. This is the time people want to sneak into the country. I'm serious. This is the period of time people sneak into the country more. So we have to be very, 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 very careful. And the border should be very protected and regulated that illegal immigrants should not be able to should not be allowed into the country without having the papers and being, uh, and being credited uh, or permitted to come into the country in the first place. This is a very, very serious topic. I love the entire video. I love how Charlie answered every single one of them maturely and with a very, very right mindset and direct to the point. That is the main thing, direct to the point. And he didn't hide it. As a Christian, if you see someone who is transgenderism, who are, who are transgender, who are woke, who are LGBTQ, Tell them the truth. Either they accept it or not, as long as you are able to spill out the truth. One day or another, they will remember your statements and they will say, someone like this told me this, this specific period of time. But once you keep on lying to them that is your body, your choice, you will keep them in that delusional aspect that they are in right now. So as a Christian, according to what Charlie said, spill out the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's only the truth that can set you free. So tell them the truth, either they accept it or not. As long as you are, your conscience is clear and you have told it, I have spoken out the truth. That is what that is what matters. Comment down below what you think about this video. Give us a thumbs up. Share this video as many as can. Subscribe to channel. We'll see you guys in the next video, guys. Make sure you stay, guys, safe. I just want a bag like an old lady. I'm back wood smoking. I don't own papers. Pass that 808. That don't, don't shake her. Oh, bitch, you know I'm grinding like a pro skater. Baby, mama bugging. I'm so quick to hit ignore. Buku bitch, in my bed. I got scales all